Thank you very much. It is a real pleasure and an honor to be here. I always especially like speaking in front of Christian audiences because it makes me very happy whenever a Jewish boy makes good in the world. <laughs> I think I'm here um, for two reasons, in addition to providing comic relief. <laughs> I think that um, I am part of the interfaith in, in this enterprise, um, which is always a healthy corrective for all of us. Uh, and the second is to the degree that um, your Christian identity and faith uh, as we heard so beautifully in this morning's presentation, is rooted in the House of Israel, then it may be of some personal interest to see where those roots have also gone. Um, so that's really what I want to do. So we're passing out two different uh, pieces of paper. You should, at some point before I really launch, have in front of you one piece of paper that says special needs Jewish sources. We'll be spending a good deal of time on that. And the second sheet is a beautiful graphic that I have designed because I want to lay out for you what Judaism looks like graphically uh, before we move into the details. So I'm going to wait until everyone's got something and then, and then we'll launch. getting there? We're going to start with the chart. Does everyone have that accessible to you? So there is a common perception um, among many people, I think, in the world that what Judaism is, is the religion of the Old Testament, so-called. Um, and while it is true that the Hebrew Bible is at the heart of Jewish tradition, it is no more true of Jewish tradition in some ways than it is of Christian tradition to think of us in that way. And so I've done this chart primarily for Jews, but I think it's also useful for other audiences to get a sense at least of how Judaism perceives itself. Um, it's fine with me if you don't think this is accurate. You, you have a long line of people who think that much of what I say is hokum. But, um, <laughs> but at the very least, a lot of us think this is true. So, so the upper right-hand corner, uh, which is in Hebrew, says Matan Torah. That means the giving of Torah. <coughs> Right? And, and Judaism understands the giving of the Torah as part of a reciprocal act in which it is both given and received at the same time. So there can't be Matan Torah, the giving of Torah, without Kabbalat Torah, the receiving of Torah, which is not viewed as a passive act, but rather as an active role for both partners in the act. But the Matan Torah comes out then in two ways. Up at the top of the page, where it says written Torah, that's a translation of the Hebrew above it, Torah Shebich Tav. Torah is understand to be given in two forms. Torah comes from the Hebrew word for teaching or instruction. It does not mean law. It means teaching or instruction, which is why the person who teaches in front of a class is a mora if it's a boy teacher, and a mora if it's a lady teacher. Right? The written Torah um, comes in three different subgroups. The first is Torah. Those are the first, the five books of Moses, the Chumash, the scroll that we have. Um, the second cluster is Nevi'im, which means the prophets, the prophetic writings, Joshua, Judges, Kings 1 and 2, and then Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, all those guys. Um, and then Chetuvim, which means the writings, Psalms, Proverbs, uh, 
Jonah we heard referred to, Job we heard referred to. Um, those together, all three, form what Christians call the Old Testament. Jews do not do that because we do not recognize that it has been replaced by a new testament, testament meaning covenant and agreement. Um, so the way Jews will refer to it is as Tanakh, which you'll note is the first letters of all three sections that make up the Hebrew Bible. If, if you want to be culturally neutral in your reference, you can call it Hebrew Bible. That just refers to the language that it was written in. Um, and then the Greek Bible, which refers to the language it was in. You all saved yourself a lot of wear and tear when you decided that the English was equally revealed. Um, we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> So the second phase or mode of giving of Torah is not the written Torah, but the oral Torah. Right? And for many Jews and Christians, this seems counterintuitive. There's a sense in which, well, I accept that the written Torah, that was given by God, but the oral Torah, that's just stuff that you rabbis did. Um, and that always sounds like a dirty word when people use it in that context. I love it. Um, <laughs> So, so that is not how Judaism understands itself. We understand that the written and the oral Torah were both given simultaneously. And that is to say then that God's giving of Torah never stops. It is an ongoing and continuous act. It is happening even at this moment. Anytime to meet, to study scripture, anytime people say words of truth to each other, that is a moment of Sinai. That is a moment of divine revelation. So the oral Torah, the Torah Sheba al Peh, comes in two primary modes. The first is the Talmud, um, which is made up of a primary layer called Mishnah. Mishnah is the earliest compilation of rabbinic law from around the year 200 CE. Um, the commentary to the Mishnah is Gemara. And Gemara and Mishnah together are Talmud. Talmud is not a commentary to the written Bible. It often involves the written Bible, but it has its own dynamic. In much the same way, if you will indulge me for a moment, I think it would be wrong to say that the New Testament is a commentary on the old. It is, of course, suffused with references to the earlier scriptures, but its, far, its center of gravity is not simply an explication of the meaning of the Hebrew scriptures. In the same way, the Talmud has lots and lots and lots of quotes from Hebrew scripture, but it is not centered in a commentary on that. It has its own agenda. Right? Uh, and then there is Midrash. Uh, Midrash is one of my favorite rabbinic uh, creations, something that I don't think really you find in Christian tradition. Um, and that is interpretations of the Bible that can be quite raucous, quite playful, quite boundary breaking. In Midrash, it's permissible to come up with mutually incompatible interpretations, each of which conveys some aspect of truth. And that's absolutely fine. Um, okay, and then that flow of oral Torah continues in the five pillars you see here. Um, the first being mysticism, Kabbalah, which goes back into antiquity and continues to this day. There are Jewish mystics, as there are mystics in the Christian and the Muslim and in other world traditions as well. Philosophy, uh, the attempt to make rational sense out of it and provide some kind of logical coherence to one's religious convictions and practices. Codes are comprehensive presentations of Jewish law in an orderly way. Right? So that is, uh, those of you who have studied Talmud know that you can say many things about Talmud, but no one has ever accused it of being organized in a logical fashion. Um, but that got remedied by the codes. Responsa are specific questions to specific issues. Rabbi, tell me, do we do it this way or do we do it that way? Those answers have been compiled in written form across the ages. They become part of the ongoing harvest of Jewish law. And then finally, commentaries, which are sequential explanations. Those do exist in abundance in Christianity and Islam as well.
The importance here is I want you to note that those are continuing to this day, which is to say that Judaism is in some important sense a religion rooted in Torah, but continuing to flourish. That is to say that Judaism, like Christianity, like Islam, like Hinduism, has a history and it continues to move across the ages. One of the things that that means that people don't like to think about um, is that not every Jewish source agrees with every Jewish source. Uh, for those of you who have met Jews, that shouldn't be very surprising. Um, it is, I think, also true of other world traditions, but I think at least within Christianity uh, and Islam, they don't like to admit it. Um, so they kind of give you a nice spin on the story um, to make it sound like it actually really did honestly agree with what it sure sounds like it's not agreeing with. Um, okay, we're ready to start our sources. You ready? Here we go. So I have a range of them and I don't expect us to cover all of them. Uh, and this is also by no means a representative, complete sample. There's plenty more that I could have put in. Um, and I also was deliberately weak in the Bible area because I figure you all have access to that yourself. Um, you can read scriptures without my help. Um, but I did want to put some highlights in there and then I want to move rapidly to the sources that you wouldn't really have access to without a dashingly good looking rabbi standing in the front of the room. <laughs> that was not a joke. Leviticus. <laughs> Leviticus 19, you shall not insult the deaf or place a stumbling block before the blind. You shall revere your God, I am the Holy One. So a couple things to point out that you may not have noticed uh, about this. If you're deaf, you wouldn't hear that someone had insulted you. So what's the damage? What's the injury done in that case when nobody knows. You put a stumbling block before someone who's blind, they'll figure it out. Uh, it'll end badly, but they'll figure it out. But someone who's deaf, who you insult as they're walking by, they never know. So what's the damage? And, and the rabbis comment that in places where it's not obvious or where the party being injured is too weak to be able to effectively protest, it's at that point that God routinely says, I am the Lord your God. Right? You cannot revere God if you are insulting the deaf, whether they know it or not. Because to fashion a world in which people are marginalized because of their label is a world in which none of us are safe in which none of us can truly live in the presence of the divine. Right? Um, so that's why it ends with revering God. Revere, by the way, is the nice cleaned up translation of the Hebrew word yirah, which in the old King James Version is translated as fear. Um, and I do want to leave at least a taste of that fear in your reverence. Um, God is not meant to be the buddy that you stick in your pocket who forgives all of your shortcomings while judging your enemies, which is how many of God's servants like to think about the Holy One. Right? Um, we should all be just a little bit afraid of someone who knows you truly. Imagine your spouse on steroids. <laughs> you can't hide. All of your flaws are visible and you are nonetheless loved. That has to be a terrifying idea. From the prophet Isaiah. Then the ears of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute shall shout aloud. Now I want to read this text on a couple different incompatible levels. The first is of simple acceptance, which is to say that the prophet anticipates that the coming redemption of God will be one in which those who have not been able to participate will participate fully. How wonderful, how extraordinary that we will all be dancing 
at the coming redemption. There will be none of us not shouting aloud, swirling around. But I also want to point out, here comes a subversive reading, the protest reading, that it's inconceivable to the prophet that when the redemption comes, there would be people who are blind or deaf or have special needs. How awful. A world in which our universality has to be uniformity is no world I want to be part of. And I do think that is a shortcoming of Isaiah's otherwise grand vision that he can't imagine a world in which people are who they are. And that's what redemption looks like. So part of our challenge in approaching an ancient book like scripture, an ancient collection of opinions like scripture, is not to do as so many of our mealy-mouthed co-religionists do and apologize because someone put it in print. There have to be times where we both celebrate the beauty of the vision and then call them to terms. And this is one of those texts where it's not enough to just say what a magnificent vision it is. And it's also an oppressive vision. Okay. Um, the prophet Jeremiah. I will bring them in from the Northland, gather them from the ends of the earth. This is the people Israel. The blind and the lame among them, those with child and those in labor. In a vast throng they shall return here. They shall come with weeping and with compassion will I guide them. I will lead them to streams of water by a level road where they will not stumble. For I am ever a parent to Israel. Ephraim is my firstborn. I got nothing bad to say here. This just seems to me that Jeremiah, as always, gets it 100%. All right. The goal is not to stop the blind from being blind, although if we can help with sight, that's great, nor to stop the lame from being lame in our midst, although if we can create greater access to mobility, that's also good. But we can level the roads, right? And that's what redemption looks like. Redemption is where the roads are level so that nobody stumbles. And so that kind of providing of access, God does because God is our parent. And good parenting is about providing access. Um, I will also point out to you that among the blind and the lame, apparently being with child is a kind of deformity. <laughs> the prophet Micah. In that day, declares the Holy One, I will assemble the lame and will gather the outcast and those I have treated harshly, and I will turn the lame into a remnant and the expelled into a populous nation, and the Holy One will reign over them on Mount Zion now and evermore. Notice this recurrent refrain among the prophets of Israel that in that great day of ingathering, in that day when we all return home, none will be left out. Those who are currently not included, they will be in our midst. Indeed, they will be at the very center of it. They shall become the remnant. Right? It's a really powerful vision and consistent with the vision of the prophets. As you heard in the earlier talk, exemplified in much of Jesus's teachings, he is in that regard continuous with the prophets of Israel in his, what some would call, obsession with who's being left out, who's being marginalized, who's being made invisible, who in their particularity is not present among us. And redemption is when that doesn't happen anymore. Redemption is when we're all there. And not all there in some abstract way, but with our differences, with who we are. I will rescue the lame and gather the strayed, and I will exchange their disgrace for fame and renown in all the earth. At that time I will gather you, and at that time I will bring you home. The prophet Zephaniah. Right, I want you to note 
that disgrace is not because of their disability. Disgrace is because of the way people who are so-called whole-bodied construe people with disability. I will venture for you the first of many armchair psychological assessments of which I'm not qualified. Um, and that is, I think that the reason people are so scared of people with special needs is because we will all one day be special needs. There is no way to leave this life unless you are lucky enough to get hit by a bus when you're a kid. But otherwise, sooner or later, things fall apart. And that means none of us leave this planet without an extensive period of having additional needs of support. I heard a wonderful professor, blind professor of Jewish law in New York City, who came to a conference like this, and she said she came to say one simple thing, and that is, there is no such thing as special needs. Everybody has human needs, and some people need special accommodations to have their normal needs met. But we all have the same needs. It's just how you get those needs accommodated may change. But there's the prophet Zephania saying more or less the same thing, that the change that will happen will not be the removal of our abilities, but will be the ability of other people to see our greatness with those abilities. And the sad note that we are as far from achieving that vision as we were in the days of Zephania. Okay, um, so let's now do some rabbinics, shall we? This is from the Jerusalem Talmud, we're in the second column, page one. A blind man came to the city of Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, and the rabbi invited him to dinner, and he sat in a position at the table even more honored than his own. And the people of the city said, this must be a great man, or Rabbi Eliezer would not have placed him above himself at the table. And they gave the man a considerable sum. To what do I owe this, the man asked. And they replied, because Rabbi Eliezer placed you above himself at the table. Then the man prayed for him as follows. You have shown loving kindness to one who is seen but cannot see. May the one who sees you but cannot be seen receive your graciousness and show loving kindness to you. So I need to translate that into English for you, I think. All right. A rabbi invites someone who is normally viewed as an object of pity. And instead of treating him like an object of pity, oh, well, you know, you should be happy if I put you at the end table. He places him in a seat of honor more elevated than his own seat. And all of the townspeople say, my goodness, if he's elevating him in that way, he must really be very important. We better give him something. So they cough up a lot of money for him. Right? And then the man responds with a blessing. This is a recurrent theme throughout rabbinic literature of people who normally one would think of as recipients of other people's pity being themselves the most powerful sources of blessing. And what an awesome blessing this is. Just as you have been gracious to one who cannot see, so should the one who cannot be seen be gracious to you. All right. What he's saying is God and I are homies. All right. We have a special connection in the seeing department. Right? So I'm authorized to speak on God's behalf. Right? Remarkable turnaround. Um, let's skip the next one. Here's another, another great one. This is page two, column one. I, I will translate the Hebrew term after I read it and then tell you why I couldn't translate it in the, the writing. If a Mitzorah does not have a thumb or a big toe, he can never achieve purification. Rabbi Elazar says the Kohen should apply the blood to the location where the thumb or the toe would be, and the Mitsora will fulfill his obligation. Mitsora uh, is someone who suffers from a chronic skin disease. 
used to be translated as leprosy. We now know that the biblical Mitzorah is not suffering from Hansen's disease, which is what the contemporary label of leprosy is. But some kind of funky skin disease that was seen as a ritual impurity. Right? And so a person who became a Mitzora was incapable of making offerings was incapable of bringing sacrifices, had to live separate from the larger community, and had to undergo a seven-day period of purification once their symptoms had disappeared. You should note that in the Hebrew Bible, we have absolutely no records of doctors, and the priests did not practice medicine. They would alert you to having, have, having a medical condition. The medical care was existent in ancient Israel. We have ancient medical implements, um, but the Bible's not interested in how doctors do what doctors do. The job of the priests is to regularize you back into the community after your medical condition has been cleaned up. So how does one do that? You take some blood from a sacrifice and you put it behind the earlobe, the big thumb, and the big toe of someone who has mitzora. Why? Because the Bible says so. That's why. And the Bible doesn't give a reason. Good enough? Just check him. So, so what happens, though, if you have a mitzora who doesn't have both earlobes, both thumbs, and both big toes, right? Does that mean, look, the Bible is explicit. You have to put blood on those places. And there are rabbis in the Talmud who said, therefore, such a person can never be purified because they don't have what the Bible requires. And I bring you this quote, which becomes normative rabbinic law because Rabbi Elazar in his greatness says, that can't be what the Bible means. Specifically, that can't be what God means. So it cannot be that someone can never be brought in. So if they don't have a big toe, put the blood where the toe would have been, as close to that spot as you got. Right? And that becomes rabbinic law. And I want to hold that up to you as a model, because we continue to take the side of the other rabbis in contemporary society all the time. One man for one woman for one lifetime. Oops, that was politically incorrect. Right? Right? And there we say, okay, so we've defined marriage in such a way that the only way you can do it is my way, and then we're going to make it illegal for you to do it any other way. That's the same thing. Right? As opposed to saying, what's the purpose of marriage? Now, how can we make it so that you can enjoy that purpose? Right? Rabbi Elazar is giving us a way of inclusion which doesn't require us to all be the same. We all can be who we are, and then we say, how do we include within that difference? Okay, um, here's another one. According to early rabbinic law, it was taken that people who were what we used to call deaf-mute, right? In antiquity, the assumption was if you couldn't hear, you probably couldn't speak. It turns out we now are able to teach people far better, and we have techniques and technology available to us that did not exist in antiquity. Um, but so here it goes. It, it, it was held that those who cannot speak are not allowed to learn. So this is a Talmudic text brought in protest to that teaching. Consider the case of two mutes who were in Rebbe's neighborhood, who were the sons of Rabbi Yochanan ben Gudita's daughter. Some say they were the sons of Rebbe Yochanan's sister. Whenever Rebbe would enter the study hall, they would enter and sit before him, and they would nod their heads and move their lips. Rebbe besought mercy on their behalf, and they were healed. Here's another ancient rabbi who's healing people who may not need it. And it was found that they were well versed in halakha, sifra, sifri, and the entire shas. I need to translate all of this for you. Um, Rebbe is the title for Rabbi Yohanan ben, no, sorry, for Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi. Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi is the author of the Mishnah, which is the core rabbinic work of law. A great man, and he was the head rabbi of his entire generation. 
So you're talking not just about any guy, you're talking about the number one guy, right? And in his classroom, he allowed these two people who, according to most other rabbis, would not have been allowed to learn. And they would make noises, move their heads, whatever, during the teaching, and the other rabbis would say, they don't, they're not taking any of this in. To my purpose, what's astonishing about this is they come up with a technology to allow them to communicate. Forget that the technology happens to be miraculous divine intervention. <laughs> and it's found that they've been following everything. Right? I have such a story in my own life. My son Jacob is severely autistic and minimally verbal. He can say more cake. Um, that's actually in my family a very important thing to be able to say. <laughs> right? He can say hug, he can say I love you, so the big things he can say, but anything other than that he has a hard time verbalizing with words. Um, several years ago we took him to a speech therapist who teaches facilitated communication, uh, which is where the person communicates on a keyboard by having their arm push away from the keyboard and then they pick the letters that they want to pick. Um, it used to be controversial. Um, I think it is now only controversial to people who've never actually participated in it. Uh, it is quite clear that my son is doing the communication. This is no Ouija board. In fact, we now hold him only by the back of the arm, up here in the upper arm, and he still types, um, most of the time now chewing us out. <laughs> so that's how I know it's... <laughs> Actually, the, the, the moment where I dropped my skepticism, he came home from school one day and um, Alana asked him what happened in school and he typed, ugly girl taught us. So my wife called the teacher and she said, do you mind explaining to me why my son typed this? And she said, well, at the last minute I got called out for an IEP. I assume here I don't need to say what an IEP is for most of you. It's a, uh, a way for bureaucrats to torture innocent people. Um, <laughs> So she said, I got called out for an IEP, and let me just say that his assessment of the substitute isn't wrong. <laughs> Hard to imagine that being a projection of my wife, you know, why she would want him to, anyway. So, so we had that same experience, though. It turns out Jacob had taught himself how to read. He had taught himself the entire, we thought he wasn't paying attention. Right? It turns out it was my typical daughter who wasn't paying attention. Right? Whenever she wants to remember something from her childhood, she has to ask her autistic brother. Um, but we needed the technology to make his communication possible. Jacob now travels around the country speaking at conferences on inclusion. You should have him come to some conference of yours. If you go online and you Google Jacob Artson, you can read some of his essays. He's written very insightful things, none of which we thought were in there except we always knew they were in there. Right? So, so here's an ancient story along those lines. Okay, uh, this one is my all-time favorite Talmud story, the next one from Chagiga 5b. Rebbe and Rebbe Chia were once going on a journey. When they came to a certain town, they said, if there's a rabbinical scholar here, we'll go and pay our respects. The inhabitants told them, there is a rabbinic scholar here, but he's blind. Said Rebbe Chia to Rebbe, you stay here, don't degrade your position of Nasi. I will go and pay my respects. Rebbe refused to listen, and so he went along. And when they were departing from the blind scholar, that scholar said to them, you came to pay your respects to one who has seen but does not see. May you merit to pay your respects to the one who sees, but is not seen. And Rebbe turned to Rebbe and said, Had I listened to you, you would have deprived me of this blessing. Remember, Rebbe is the number one rabbi in all of the land of Israel, and Rebbe Chia is his sidekick, and what we in Los Angeles call personal assistant. And they're doing a tour of the outlying towns, and in all the outlying towns, the first thing the Grand Rabbi says is, is there a scholar here, because I should meet that scholar? And the answer is, there is one, but he's blind, right? 
And the assumption is, well, then you should not meet him because you, after all, are a great rabbi. And it would degrade your high office to be in the presence of someone blind. Notice we're never told the name of the blind guy. Right? No actual blind person is used in the fabrication of this story. Right? This is a story designed to teach a lesson, which is an anonymous blind guy in some nowheresville place may well hold the very blessing you need. And if you don't go out of your way to find that person and to create the context for an exchange of blessings, you'll live your life without the very blessing that you needed to have. And again, it's that same blessing we saw on the other page. Right? So it turns out there's this undercurrent, and, and by the way, the Talmud was meant to be the work of rabbinic education. Right? Anyone who hopes and hoped to become a sage in Israel, I mean among the people of Israel, has to be a master of Talmud. So in the book that's meant for the powerful and the honored are all these stories about anonymous people with disabilities and they are the ones who bless the rabbis. And it is the mark of the greatest rabbi that he brushes aside the objections of his underlings to make access to these anonymous people. That's what being a great rabbi is. All right. So it turns out, I just want to point out, the stories you read in the Gospel are not so much stories in revolt against rabbinic norms, but exemplifying rabbinic norms. OK, um, let's go on. I brought in a couple awful quotes because I just wanted to be honest about the tradition. So the middle of the first column on page three from Gitin 23a, it is understandable why a deaf mute, an insane person, and a minor are disqualified because they are not mentally competent. Pretty hideous. An article found by a deaf mute, an insane person, or a child is covered by the laws of theft for the sake of peace. Rabbi Yossi says it's real theft. What does that mean? Right, the anonymous position is something found by these, by these people is covered by the laws of theft, mipnei darchei shalom, for the sake of peace, for the sake of harmony. What does that mean? It means because they don't have real intention, you can't really consider it theft. You can't really consider something they find to have been stolen. But for the sake of everyone getting along, we'll pretend like we do. Right? Rabbi Yossi says, no, 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 gazal gamur, it's real theft. Right? Now, here's a place in which I want to tell you something that I would not have learned had I not been the father of a boy with autism now a man. One of the ways you can render someone absolutely invisible and marginal is by smothering them in pity. Oh, booby, I expect nothing from you because you're pathetic. Right? That's not doing anyone a favor. Right? True accommodation is saying, here are the standards, now let's talk about what it takes for you to do the work to rise to those standards and me to remove artificial impediments. So what Rabbi Yossi is saying is, no, no, these people are real people. And therefore, when they steal, it's really theft. And you have to treat it like really like theft. So I'm bringing that one because it sounds harsh, right? And, and it is true that sometimes you watch us talking with our son, and we can sound harsh too. You have to answer these homework questions, Jacob. But as a result of those years of harshness, he will get his high school diploma next year, which nobody said he could do. And he's doing it because his mother is the most stubborn female on the planet. <laughs> 
French and Chinese moms have no tigers to compare to a Jewess engaged. <laughs> But because Ilana refused ever to back down, he would type, I hate you, and then answer the questions. And he's going to graduate high school. Right? That's Rebbe Yossi. That's the strictness of standards. This is a great and funky Gemara story, the bottom of the first column. Bahayahu said to Ashmedai, Ashmedai, for those of you who don't know, is a demon. Right? And there are demons throughout Talmudic rabbinic literature. Rarely are they named, but Ashmedai is a kind of celebrity among demons. So um, he always gets billing. <laughs> Why, when you saw that blind man who had lost his way, did you guide him back on his way? And Ashmedai replied, there was an announcement regarding him in heaven that he is perfectly righteous, and whoever provides him with comfort merits the world to come. Now, here are some of the things I love about this story. I, I love the fact that it's the demon who knows what's going on in heaven. I love the fact that it's the demon who's worried about getting life in the world to come. I love the fact that it's the demon who's doing something nice for the blind guy. I love the fact that the anonymous blind guy is the one who's so righteous that all you have to do is do something nice for him and you get eternal life. <laughs> right? The Talmud is full of these explosions, these subversive stories that shatter the tranquil surface because they need to be exploded. They need to be blown up. And this is one of those great stories Right? So, so it turns out the demon helped the blind guy get back on track because he wanted to merit the world to come. And frankly, if you're a demon, it's not so easy to get eternal life. Um, and the Talmud just presents this story and then moves on. They don't say a word about it, which is just delicious. Right? So, um, so I, I share this with you because Whoever provides such a person comfort merits the world to come. And uh, when they ask you who you heard that from, you tell them you got that from Ashmedai. Um, okay, second column, page three. The second to last quotation. Whatever God has declared unfit in the case of an animal has been declared desirable in the case of a person. In animals, God declared unfit the blind or broken or maimed or those that have a boil. But in people, God declared the broken and contrite heart to be most desired. Right, so this is a reference to the Levitical laws of sacrifice. An animal can't have a blemish and be offered as a sacrifice. But here the rabbis are commenting <clears throat> that the opposite is true for people. Now I have to tell you I'm troubled by this. I'm troubled by this because one of the ways that the world makes differently abled people invisible is to turn them into oracles. Right? So my son is not perfect just because he's autistic. And he doesn't have a direct intuitive line that connects him to God so that he's always living a life of complete holiness. Sometimes he's a jerk and a bigot. Right? This kind of verse tries to turn that on its head, but what I think motivates it is a recognition that we often treat people as broken and blemished and we treat them as unfit, as did the Levitical sacrificial system treat lambs and goats. And what this rabbi is throwing his weight against is doing that with human beings. So that the things that render a sheep not qualified as a sacrifice does not in any way lessen the divinity of the human being standing in front of you. And you need to keep that distinction in mind. 
Okay, last page, three final quotations, and then I, I've, I've thrown a lot at you, and I want to leave some room for comments of your own. This is from Isaac Moseson, a poet. Living God, help me always to feel like the blind, to see like the deaf, to hear like the mute, and to love like the dying. It's a beautiful poem, isn't it? Right. We all have our gifts, right? And depending on how you count ability, we all have our disabilities. The challenge is to not be defined by what you can't do, but to celebrate all that you can. My son Jacob, who is pretty autistic, um, has the unfortunate ability of hearing through walls. It's a little bit like living with the KGB. <laughs> right, so Jacob, two stories down, will hear me on the cell phone and hear the person on the phone talking. This was very helpful going through high school because I'm sure you have all experienced sitting in a deadly boring classroom. Well, Jacob had no trouble. He would just start listening to the rooms around his room until he found one that was worth paying attention to. <laughs> So he would come home and he would type all kinds of interesting things he had learned in the African history class. But, but Jacob, you weren't in African history. No, I know, but the guy in mathematics was really boring, so I was, well, or we'll take him on a trip somewhere, he'll come home from going to the doctor or whatever, and he'll start talking about what was on national public radio. But Jacob, we didn't have the radio on. Yeah, I know, but there was a car, two cars over on the freeway, and they did, so I was listening. Um, so, to feel like the blind and to see like the deaf. Right? The challenge that all of us have is to get to know someone well enough so that you can see how they shine. And you can see what's unique and precious about them. Everyone has it we don't always take the time to find it. This from Judith Glass, uh, she wrote this blessing. Let us bless the source of life in its infinite variety that creates all of us whole, none of us perfect. I love that blessing. And then this from my son Jacob. For most of my life, my existence was controlled by autism. Autism was at the root of every experience I had or didn't have. I lived with constant anger at my disability and feared that it would isolate me forever. One day last year, my wonderful physician and mentor asked me what is the opposite of anger, and I realized that it is not the absence of anger, but rather acceptance, laughter, and joy. I also realized that fear and anger just produces more fear and anger while acceptance brings connection to God and humanity. For many years I had been praying for God to cure my autism and wondering why God didn't answer my prayer. I realize now it is because I have been praying for the wrong reason. I started to pray for the strength to accept autism and to live with joy, laughter, and connection. My prayers have been answered more richly than I ever imagined. I still passionately hate autism, but now I love life more than I hate autism. Thank you very much. So we have about 10 minutes now for some questions. Thanks so much. I really appreciate the uh, comment on the Levitical passage about priests who have various blemishes who are not allowed to offer uh, uh, sacrifice or not allowed to uh, present to the people of the Lord in the temple. You mean do I like it or not? <laughs> so uh, the implications of it. You know that according to the Torah, a Kohen must be whole in body 
and that means all limbs where they're supposed to be. Um, otherwise, he is not able to participate in offering sacrifices. Um, so the first thing I want to say is one of the things I most love about Judaism <coughs> is that we retain memory of the priestly rituals while removing from the priests all power. So in the Bible, the way you became a priest, a Kohen, was by being the son of a Kohen. Right? And so it was inherited rather than earned. But rabbinic tradition, which by the way includes right now Christianity and Islam, the way you become clergy in any of those Abrahamic traditions, thanks to the ancient rabbis, is personal talent, merit, hard work, and study. Um, so the, the implicit critique of the biblical system is that none of the so-called biblically-based religions practice it anymore. Right? In all cases, religious leadership is earned, and it's earned based on integrity and compassion and wisdom and faith and skill rather than who's your daddy. Um, so I think that what the Bible is meant to teach us, though, because I ultimately am deeply loyal to the Torah, um, is to hold out an idealized version um, that's meant to be a source of lessons rather than of practice. Right? I'm in no big rush to rebuild the temple. I'm in no big rush to start sacrifices again. Apparently God isn't either. Um, and I think, therefore, that for the foreseeable future, it is an object for us to study. And part of the ways I would study that text is, A, by talking about the dangers of ever implementing such a system, and B, what does it mean to say that those who are your religious leaders should be perfect? What, what does that ideal imply? I do think we've given up on that too quickly. Well, I you speak about PD, okay? Um, in biblical traditions, you have people who come to Jesus and say, Jesus has PD on me, or yeah, he had PD on them. Is PD always, always bad? <laughs> uh, no, pity is not always bad, and frankly, if the worst sin we ever commit is to have too much pity, we would be in much better shape than we currently are. I can think very easily of sins that are far worse than pity. But here's the undercurrent of pity. And, and, and part, look, I'm also at a disadvantage. I don't read Greek. So I actually don't know what people were saying when they said to Jesus, have pity on me. I know that some British guy 400 years ago translated a Greek word as pity. Right? Beware the Brits. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so I don't know what that word means. And they were probably not speaking Greek. They were probably speaking Aramaic. Right? And so I don't know which word they were using or which Hebrew word they would be using. But I can tell you that the word that most often gets translated as, as a kind of pity, it, I think, it is rachamim, which, which means really compassion, right? So God is called rachamana, the compassionate one, in Arabic as well. And, um, and rachamim comes from the same Hebrew root, Semitic root, for rechem, which is the womb, W-O-M-B. Right? So when you call God Rachamim, you are saying the womb-like one. Right? You're, you're referring to a kind of maternal birthing capacity. The ability to see me as your child. So here's what happens when I do that. Right? As, as clergy, we are all faced with something I'm going to use a technical term for. We are faced with an onslaught of nudniks. <laughs> Nudnik is a Yiddish term 
for a cloying and aggravating human being who you really would like to avoid, but they keep shoving themselves into your face. We have a moment in the service where clergy are tortured in this way. It's right after the service when we serve little cookies and whatever, and the only thing the clergy person wants to do is sit down and be left alone, having run a service for however long, and that's when the nudniks run over <laughs> and surround you. And what I have found as a technique for being able to function effectively in such moments is to say, if I were this person's dad, what would I notice? And it's amazing that just asking the question lets me see their good side. If I were their dad, if I were their mom, what would I be seeing right now? I think that's what they're asking for when they ask for pity. They're asking, don't look down on me. Don't look on me as a case in which you can show how generous you are. That's how pity gets abused. But, but if you see me really for who I am, look, it was Jesus who said, when asked what are the greatest of the commandments, this one, this you should know. I assume I'm, I'm not telling you something you're not familiar with. What are the greatest of the commandments? Love the Lord your God, right? That's straight out of Leviticus. And love your neighbor as yourself. That's straight out of Leviticus, right? You do those two things, it turns out you're a good Torah Jew, <laughs> right? So, so, and it also turns out you can't do the one without the other. So I think what they're saying when they say pity there is if you can truly see your neighbor as yourself, then, then you're really in a position to see the divine and to bring the divine into the world. I think that's what they were asking for. And the challenge was, then as now, there are very few people who can do that. Right? So, so Jesus and Rebbe Elazar and other greats in the various world traditions, the Buddha called us to that, Muhammad called us to that. There are great teachers of wisdom whose job was to wake us up to the humanity of the people who come before us. Right? And if that's what you mean by pity, that's great. But often pity winds up being used as a way to push the person away. Right? I've done what I need to do for you, now go away. And that doesn't help. If all we do in providing access is build ramps for people to go up, but we don't change the way we look at them, then we have done nothing. Hmm. I just wanted to say thank you to you and Jacob and your family for sharing your stories. Thank you. There's something very, very powerful in stories. And also thank you to, for challenging us to challenge our text. Yes, thank you. It's only fair since our texts challenge us all the time. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. I was really interested in, in the, your uh, analysis of the, the, the uh, text from Isaiah, um, because we were wrestling yesterday with this idea of what it is to be perfect, the perfect world of creation. And there's something in there about that. Um, what's your, what, what analysis would you give of you know, God being perfect and having a perfect world and you know, these, these whole concepts? Okay. Um, so now I must come out of my closet, um, which is not about sexual orientation. I'm too old to even bother with the sexual orientation anymore. I just want a nap. Um, <laughs> I believe that much of our metaphysics is filtered through Greek philosophy to the detriment of our metaphysics. So Aristotle and Plato need God to be unchanging and eternal. And they therefore tell us that that's what God's perfection is. But anyone who has read the Bible for more than two minutes knows that the God of the Bible is anything but unchanging anything but outside of space and time. The central metaphor of both sections of the Bible 
is of a God who enters into time and enters into relationship. And you cannot be in relationship if you're not open to change. I was counseling a man the other week who was getting his fourth divorce, that is to say his fourth wife leaving him uh, after the other three had. By the way, I just want to point out that if you enter into a relationship with someone who's been married three times already and left each of those times, you might want to ask yourself some bigger questions, but whatever. So, so he was counseling with me and he said, you know, Rabbi, this time I know that it wasn't my fault because I haven't changed a bit from the day I met her. <laughs> so I do believe that God is perfect, but here's what I mean by perfect. God is eternally self-surpassing. And we are called to be eternally self-surpassing as well. That thing that used to be a limit need not remain a limit. That doesn't mean you can do everything, but it does mean that God's perfection is not static and it is not unchanging, nor should ours be. So notice that in the creation, God never says this creation is perfect. What God says is kitov me'od. Wow, this is awesome good. Right? Awesome good is not the same thing as perfect. It's just really good. Right? And we are invited to be tov me'od, to be really good. But perfect is the enemy of the good. There's a hand right here. Can you talk about uh, God choosing Moses, who had a speech impairment, and Jacob's disability? Yes, yeah, so you will note that what I did not do was the clean, safe Old Testament talk. All right, so I will now do that in three seconds, because that's really all it's worth. Um, all right, and the safe Old Testament and disability talk is Moses had a speech impediment, Jacob limped. You kind of go through a cluster of biblical figures and show their physical shortcomings. Um, look, I suppose that's fair on one level. It is true Moses did have that. But in 2,000 years of church, mosque, and synagogue commentary, nobody ever held them up as examples of special needs inclusion until the secularists pointed out to us that we need to be worried about special needs inclusion. So um, that doesn't automatically make it wrong, and it doesn't mean it's not in the religious tradition, but I am suspicious of building it on that basis. Um, Moses would have been shocked to receive handicapped parking stickers. Um, which, I will point out, he would have only used six days a week. <laughs> so, so I didn't give that talk. The other one that I actually was tempted to talk about, my favorite special needs figure in biblical scriptural tradition, is Mephibosheth. Yeah. Yes, everybody here knows Mephibosheth. Um, he's not so well known outside of this circle, I just got to <laughs> tell you. Um, but part of what I love about Mephibosheth um, is his greatness is a greatness of character, right? When David falsely accuses him of being disloyal and he proves to David's satisfaction that he's loyal and David says, okay, I will give you back the property, he says, I don't want the property. I I'm not motivated by wealth. I'm motivated by bigger things than that. I just want to serve you. And I think that's an astonishing thing that Mephibosheth is one of the spiritual giants of the Bible and I happen to think he learned that because of his special needs, which he was not born with. They were imposed upon him. Um, and the other thing that amazes me about that story is David's response. Because David responds not with pity. What David says he needs is chesed Elohim. Mm. If you don't know the word chesed, you should learn it. Chesed is the Hebrew, you know how it's said that Eskimos have 50 different words for snow? 
Well, Jews have 50 different words for love. Right? So the Bible has all these different terms for love. Chesed is one of them. Chesed is not pitter-patter, I have to have you, baby. <laughs> I'm not going to, okay, that was very mature on my part, that thought that I didn't share with you. <laughs> See? Self-surpassing. How's that? <laughs> Chesed is love that becomes manifest in action. If you're not showing the love, then you're not doing Chesed. All right? and, and God routinely talks about the value of chesed. Chesed chafatzti v'lozevach. I wanted your chesed and not your sacrifice. Right? So, David says that what Mephibosheth deserves is God's chesed. Right? And I think that should be the watchword for special needs activists. Right? It's not about ahava, that feeling of, oh, poor you. It's chesed. What do you need me to do? What do you need us to do to make a world in which your humanity is clear, in which your path is obvious? Right? Um, so that's why I didn't talk about those characters. And I also wanted to give you stuff that you didn't already have. Thank you very much.